So I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about the high plains. I've been asked to say a few words about the high plains, but then I'm going to talk about the, uh, act first a little bit more in the West and some general concepts. And and I'm going to pretend like I'm from New Jersey, uh, and so one of the Western aquifers is going to be the Mississippi Embayment, just as an example. So, um, so let's go ahead. So there's my outline. So the high plains aquifers, and it's very important to realize that not all aquifers look like the high plains. Um, and then is groundwater storage is just part of the story. And then the, the t human time scales versus hydrologic time scales, which have already, already been mentioned in, in ways this morning. Uh, we always consider groundwater drought proof, but is it really? And how can we make it more drought proof? And finally, a little bit about groundwater visibility, which Sharon mentioned there at the end of her talk. So there's the High Plains Aquifer. Um, this is a map of principal aquifers, about 60 some that USGS put out. Any individual state has a much finer resolution of their aquifers. Um, but the High Plains, of course, is a, is a big one there, covering eight states. If there's any doubt about its importance, this is a listing of uh, a graph of uh, water withdrawals by principal aquifer from about the year 2000, actually, the date to apply. But the top bar there, you'll notice, is uh, the High Plains Aquifer. And you have to go back a ways till you see the Central Valley and the Mississippi River Valley alluvial aquifer is sort of running neck and neck for number two. Thanks to the drought, I think Central Valley has moved slightly ahead. But then, for example, basin arranged uh, basin fill aquifers, Sharon talked about a lot big piece of that in, in Arizona. Uh, the Florida aquifer, which is a very important source of water for people in Florida, and the list goes on. So this is what people think of when they think of an aquifer like the High Plains. This is just a cross section through a piece of can through an area of Kansas, and you can see the declining water table there. Uh, it's actually in ways a very simple aquifer in the sense that it's an unconfined aquifer. It's got a nice and uh, something you can at least call relatively impermeable as the base of the aquifer. Uh, there's a lot of complexity, however, that's, that's not shown there in the area above the water table, the Beto zone, which is getting bigger and bigger all the time, uh, and at the land surface in terms of the soils. That all those properties are very important in terms of controlling what happens in that aquifer. But that's what people think of when they think of an aquifer. And this shows the water level change map. Um, and one other that's already been shown for 2005 is the most recent, and the areas with the biggest declines are shown in red there. So you can see most of the declines in the southern part, western Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma, Panhandle. Um, what's interesting, though, what's really unique about the High Plains Aquifer, uh, which will come out, I believe, is that we have the data to show this kind of map. So it has a, every state in the High Plains has a, a, a rigorous water level monitoring program, and they are combined together working with USGS to produce this kind of map. Unfortunately, these kind of data don't exist for many of our other important actors. I actually did one study in the High Plains very early in my career, and I'll explain what's shown there, a bathtub and an egg carton. So in the 1970s and 80s, economists were trying to look at weight, you know, value of regulation and so on. Uh, for the High Plains Aquifer, and they, they were essentially treating the aquifer as a bathtub. So in other words, if any, a very simple model, if any given farmer pulls water out of the bathtub, it's just spread out all over the place, and it's not really providing him or her any real, uh, anything to be, any real reason to conserve. Um, however, an economist must have been shown a hydrogeology textbook at one point and saw that the, what did what saw the cone of depression around a pumping well. So he came back and he said, no, this isn't a bathtub. You got it all wrong. It's an egg carton, and each individual farmer is really only affecting themselves because they've got this cone of depression around the well. Well, what they forgot is time and what's going to happen over time. So we did a little study, economist to myself, uh, and this just kind of summarizes it, um, where we took just sort of a general management area, kind of stayed, stayed away from streams, Always some complication there, but just to ask the question, you know, if, if within this management area, if farmers saved water uh, uh, over a 10 or 20 year period, how much of that water would they actually have for themselves still under that management area and how much would they have lost? And as you can see, once you get up around 500, so uh, to even 250 square miles, you start to see that a lot of the water was still there. They were really benefiting themselves by having, and I think this actually points to the to why we have conservation districts and things like that, where you have big enough areas that 
it can actually have it, a group can have an impact. Okay, so let's look at, here's a different aquifer. This is the Mississippi Embayment. You can see, see it on a map there in the upper left. Uh, it covers a large area. It's essentially a sand and silt and clay layers, uh, basin sloping towards the Gulf of Mexico. There are two, actually two important aquifers though in this one. Uh, you have the alluvial aquifer, very shallow aquifer that's used for agriculture. And then there's a deep aquifer called the Middle Claiborne Aquifer, which is used for, for public water supply. And they're both heavily used. Okay, so th this is a map, again, showing the outline of those two aquifers systems, okay? And the one on the left is the unconfined alluvial aquifer, and the one on the right is the confined aquifer, the one that's being pumped for water supply. And these colors are the same. They're basically um, water level drawdown to the brown being over 100 feet of water level drawdown. So the unconfined, the alluvial aquifer has maybe 200 square miles of water level decline over 100 feet. The, un the confined aquifer, however, whoops, the confined aquifer, however, has somewhere around 7,500 square miles, I believe, of, of water level drawdown greater than 100 feet. So the, you're seeing a lot greater water level drawdown in the confined aquifer than the unconfined aquifer. But if we look at the change in groundwater storage, this is the total here is in green. I'll explain why that's less than the blue in a second. Uh, but this is the alluvial aquifer. And I just told you the alluvial aquifer had a lot less water level decline than the, um, than the confined aquifer. But as you can see, the, unconfined, the confined, unconfined aquifer is really where all the storage is coming from. In fact, about a, about a quarter of the volume of water that was in that aquifer pre-development has been pumped out of the aquifer. It's lost about a quarter of its, of its uh, groundwater storage. Uh, and then the confined is way down here. Now, the reason the alluvial is less than the total is this particular simulation d doesn't show some of the confining units that water was coming from uh, as part of this modeling study. Um, but so this shows the important sort of a conveying the general idea of confined versus unconfined actors. Grace, which was mentioned by, by Sharon before, is going to detect that volume change under the under the confined aquifer, unconfined aquifer, but it's not going to really help you much with the, with the confined aquifer. Okay, let's look at another one, another example. This is the Columbia Plateau. You can see the area up here in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. By the way, I have no slides from Colorado. I learned a long time ago when you go to California, talk about Arizona. When you go to Arizona, talk about California. So, um, good tip for young people here. Anyway, about 5% of the irrigation in the United States, the irrigated land in the United States, is actually in the Columbia Plateau. Um, and so let's look at a water level. And it comes from, the, there's both an overburden aquifer, and then there's, a, there's several layers of basalt flows, which provide the bulk of the water for this uh, operation, as well as a lot of surface water irrigation. So one of the unique factors of the High Plains aquifer, actually, is it's, it's all groundwater for irrigation whereas many of these other systems have both groundwater and surface water. And this is a good example here of that. So this is a water level decline map. The important point of this map is just to show you that the blue areas are where water levels have gone up. The yellow areas are where water levels have gone down. So what you have here is you have essentially large cones of depression over 100 feet and more of water level decline. And this is one unit. This is a Wanapum unit of the, bas of the basalt units up there. Um, you have the water level declines, cones of depression intermingled with, with essentially large increases in, in groundwater storage in this particular aquifer system, which makes for an interesting management problem and also assessing the problem. The other thing, not really shown here, but you can see these rivers. There's the Columbia, you got the snake in there. Um, most of this area, or a very large percentage of this area, particularly up here, and in parts of Oregon are restricted from any further real water availability because the streams are essentially overdrafted already for the uh, salmon and other steelhead uh, trout populations. And so they're very heavily restricted. So you, you have a system that really doesn't have a lot of opportunity for additional groundwater development because of the surface water. And bear with me on this one. 
This is a, actually a picture of salmon, of a small fish, um, in, a, in a pool in, the, in Oregon and showing temperature contours. And it turns out the big fish not only eat the little fish, but they actually take the prime areas of water temperature. This is actually the big fish are all where the, where the best temperature is for fish, and the little fish are kind of trying to, trying to huddle in to get the temperature. You can see they're all, they're all huddled around that temperature that they like to have. So the key point here is, is that when we think about groundwater depletion, we have to think about global scale, all the way down to, in, many case, in some cases, what's happening to the discharge of surface water, not only in volume, but in temperature. And that's the big issue in the, in the Pacific Northwest, is really as much as the flow is the temperature of the streams, because groundwater provides a modulating influence on that temperature. OK, so basically, from these few examples, I think we can see some basic considerations in assessing groundwater depletion. First of all, groundwater is a three-dimensional system. Sometimes we forget that, looking at too many maps. Uh, we need to look at multiple scales. Multiple cones of depression are often juxtaposed with areas of little or no groundwater depletion. Um, there's certainly a very large different response of unconfined versus confined aquifers. Um, there are, I didn't get into it too much, but, but our agricultural systems are becoming more and more complex, and those are having more and more complicated factors on on, on groundwater and surface water resources. And, and since about 70% of the groundwater withdrawals and about 90% of the consumptive use of groundwater worldwide is from agriculture, if we don't understand the agricultural water practices that influences on groundwater, we don't really understand what's happening to our groundwater. Uh, there are oftentimes legal and regulatory constraints that really affect what, how much water you can use, what's really availability. The effects on environmental flows are very important as well as the availability of infrastructure and alternative water sources. And Sharon talked about that in Arizona. I have a slide on that a little bit later. OK. So now just part two. So how important is knowing the total storage groundwater volume? So this is a graph taken for the year 2001 of, uh, of the volume of water and storage in the state's pre-development and in 2001. First interesting thing there is how much water is in Nebraska. So the, the solution to the High Plains Aquifer is really to stick, uh, forget the Great Lakes. Just go get some of that good Nebraska groundwater that's not in the Republican River Basin and send it south to, to, uh, to Texas and Kansas. Um, anyway, you can see there's really not as much change as you might expect. And back, back now, I believe it's about 8% of the storage volume in the High Plains Aquifer, yet we have this critical situation. So the point is that depletion of a large, of a small part of the total volume of groundwater can have large effects on surface water, on water quality, and on subsides. And these become the limiting factors to development. And just a few examples there. Sharon mentioned the San Pedro Basin is a particular part of it near the city of, uh, near Fort Huachuca, the city of, uh, my brain's helping, what's that? Sierra Vista, thank you. It's near the city of Sierra Vista, where one or two percent of the volume of water and storage has been removed, and there are major issues associated with maintaining the flow in a very important riparian area in the Santa uh, Cruz area, Santa Pedro Basin. Houston, Texas has a huge amount of groundwater beneath it. It was totally reliant on groundwater for many years. The problem is clay beds that subside, so they've had to switch, make a very expensive switch from groundwater to surface water because of coast, right on the coast, um, and so they've had this flooding. Edwards Aquifer in Texas has really climate variability, a couple meters of groundwater storage, it almost acts like an underground water uh, reservoir, uh, can affect endangered species in, in springs like Kamal Springs there. And then this is the Republican River Basin where in the upper basin, I believe like three to 5% of the volume of water and storage was removed, but yet you had base flow reduced by 50% or so. Uh, so storage is only a very small part of the problem. Um, and, and can be misleading, actually. And part of the reason for surface water is just shown here. So if you have a partially penetrating stream but a thick aquifer system, you can't pull the water out of here, right? Um, and not have something happen up here. So you basically, you're having a small change in storage is gonna have a big effect on that stream. And so key information on critical issues becomes 
radiance and saturated thickness for surface water, groundwater, land subsidence, water levels, uh, water quality, flow systems, pumping costs, hydraulic heads. So there's a lot of different kinds of information about groundwater systems that are important. But the one I want to emphasize here, just in this one slide, is that the most important information we don't know typically is water use. Um, and you'll see an example later from Kansas somewhere that information can actually become very valuable to you because Kansas actually happens to be a place where they have good water use information. This is California. Um, okay, so part three, sort of the human versus hydrologic time scales. Um, at the top here is shown kind of the human time scale uh, where we might have current policy horizons that might, they keep, they're getting longer. Texas are now 50 years. Uh, typically they've been 20 years if they even existed for a long time. Uh, European Union was like 15. Um, and then you can see to the left of that is the typical government term and over here is your politician's attention span. So um, compare that to um, the uh, different, these are just the average residence times in different systems. So groundwater is estimated around a thousand years worldwide. It's really very highly variable from days to more than a million years, depending on where you are. Um, but the range is well above, typically above our human, how we think about things as humans. So let's take a look and where that really comes to play is in the, is in the whole idea of something called capture. So under a, the top one there shows a, a groundwater system in sort of a dynamic equilibrium. And you, you have recharge and discharge, recharge to the system, pretty much the same as discharge with whatever variability there is to, driven by climate. In the bottom, um, when you remove water from the system by pumping, you either get storage depletion or the water is going to come from a decrease in this discharge or an increase in recharge. Uh, those are really the only three main areas where you're going to get it. If we combine these two together, the increase in discharge and increase in recharge, and we call that capture. And so the water is coming either from capture or from storage depletion. And over, to what this, over time, if we just had a well next to a stream and an unconfined aquifer, it might look something like this, where if you look at the percentage of groundwater pumpage, when you first turn on the pumps, 100% of it's coming from storage but that declines with time. You just keep pumping at the same rate. And gradually, you're pulling more and more water from stream flow capture. And this capture might be also reduced evapotranspiration or reduction in spring flow or other, other ways of capturing water. And what the important point for this figure, this is just some regional aquifer studies, is to notice the red part of the pie chart there. The blue and the yellow are the increase in recharge and decrease in um, uh, discharge. But the important thing is, is that, first of all, it varies a lot for different systems, um, but it's not anywhere near to a large part of the pie for most of them. And in fact, Lenny Konikow and Stan Leek, two USGS scientists, looked at a lot of models across the United States, and to date, about 85% of the water we pump has come from capture, and about 15% from storage depletion. Gives you an idea of sort of the relative importance of the two. Uh, the other interesting thing here, just to note, is that in the West, this hatching, you see that that's not hatching there, uh, that's actually the part of that that's coming from irrigation. Again, showing the huge impact of irrigation on the water budgets of these of uh, Western aquifers in particular. And this just shows some time. Uh, this is the Colorado Plateau, Flagstaff right there. Um, there was an idea of simulation of pumping, what impact pumping would have here on these two creeks, Lower Clear Creek and Lower Chevalon Creek. Um, and the simulation took place over 50 years, from 2010 to 2060. So it's a model study. And then the pumping was turned off after 2060. This is a nice example of sort of some of the, pro some of the issues associated with the time delays. So first of all, the pumping was 9 CFS, 9 cubic feet per second. But you can see the top one here is 0.5. So that's because it's being spread out. The impacts are being spread out over time, and they're growing with time. What's the most important, it, interesting thing here is that once the pumps were turned off, it took decades for the maximum depletion to occur of those two streams, according to this model. Anyway. So the key point there is, is that 
you got to get started early in recognizing your surface water groundwater problem or you're, it's a little too late. We, I want to emphasize that because we're talking a lot, I think, about depletion here, but I want to talk about the importance of water quality, and that has the same sort of what, uh, time frame issues associated with it. And water quality in the high plains is a very big issue, um, particularly with respect to nitrate. And so this, this here shows nitrate concentration versus time. Uh, this is the increase in fertilizer use. So you can see fertilizer use has increased by tenfold plus uh, since about 1950. And then the blue are shallow land use wells that were sampled by the USGS NACLA program. Um, uh, and they're, they were dated with uh, tracer techniques such as chlorofluorocarbons. And so they each had a date. And so you can see there's a delay there in terms of the impacts of that increased nitro, nitrate load from fertilizer on those wells. And if you go to deeper ones, you can see the delay even is longer. So you have these decades-long delays in this sort of movement of nitrate. And so you have major groundwater systems in the United States, such as the Central Valley um, uh, that, and High Plains, where you have a large mass of nitrate continuing to move deeper and deeper in the system. It's in the shallower parts of the system now, but unless there's something that denitrifies it, it's going to keep going into the deeper parts of the system, and it's kind of a growing problem. Okay, uh, part three, four, uh, resilience. So we define, you hear the term resilience a lot of, time, a lot of days uh, uh, relative to groundwater. Uh, and so we define it, NGWA, we have a definition, it's the capacity of a groundwater or water resource system to either withstand short-term shocks, such as drought, or longer-term change, such as climate change. And of course, it depends on your time frame and applies to both water quantity and quality. So the question is, how resilient is groundwater? This happens to be the Central Valley of California, uh, shown here, first of all, and years down here, 62 to 2000, and the cumulative change in groundwater storage is shown in red. Uh, and then this green in the background are surface water deliveries. So the Central Valley has this very large system of Central Valley project, uh, it's the largest Bureau of Reclamation project in the United States that provides surface water supplies to the Central Valley. And uh, when it's wet, they've got water. When it's dry, they don't have as much. And people start turning to pumping. And so you can see that here in this graph that when, when you get these wet periods, you know, the storage builds back up again for a short while, and then once you get the dry periods, it plummets. And, but it never goes back, it, the, the trend is obviously down. So I would argue this is not a resilient system at this time, point in time, because it's just not being operated that way. So a few things about groundwater, drought proof and groundwater. First of all, I think we could learn a lot from surface water hydrologists who do tend to focus more on hydrologic variability and analyze our groundwater systems for resilience and vulnerability rather than just assuming they're going to be there as a backup supply. And we need to raise awareness in terms of the visibility we've talked about, about maintaining groundwater as a reserve uh, during wet periods. As soon as it, as soon as it gets, starts raining, the New York Times stops covering groundwater in California and they can all go back to knowing they're going to have their fruits and vegetables and everything's going to be okay. Uh, and we, so we need to maintain that awareness when it's raining. Uh, and monitoring is, of course, is very important. And as already mentioned, managed aquifer recharge is very important in helping this. And so well, we also need to work towards laws, regulations, and incentives. Maybe there's little we can do with the laws, but the regulations and incentives that encourage the use of surface water during wet periods and prepare, and I think prepare is the operative word here, for increased groundwater use during droughts. Whether we have climate change or not, this happens. And here's a good example. Uh, I knew Sharon would give lots, some good background on the Arizona management areas, active management areas. So um, if you'll recall, so these are the Pinal, Phoenix, Tucson. Uh, and this upper graph shows the groundwater level anomaly. So a bunch of water level measurements in that particular AMA over time from 1980 to 2010. And uh, you can see that it's not only stabilized, but in one case, in the Pinal, it actually, the groundwater levels went up. And this is a, quite a drought period in the southwestern United States, and Arizona included. 
Um, and so what you can see there is that the, the active the water, ma managed active recharge and their regulations have managed to maintain, they have made the, the, the resilient system, at least for this time frame, of their groundwater. The areas outside that Sharon pointed to, uh, quite different story. So uh, Wilcox here in the southwest, southeast part of the state, uh, Gila Bend, uh, in these areas where they're outside this area, and they don't have the benefit, in all fairness, they don't have the benefit of that central Arizona project to use for, for recharging their system, you can see what happened to the water levels. They went down. So um, this is, a good, I think, an excellent example of sort of the advantages of sort of planning ahead and also a managed act for recharge when you have the availability of water. I've been told I have one minute. Okay. All right. So I have two slides. Uh, and Sharon already mentioned this, and since the slides are going to be available, uh, we have the NGWA and American Water Resource Association. We kind of been uh, have this groundwater visibility initiative, and we put out some, some summaries of the, our first meeting along that, and Sharon actually is the one who came up with the term groundwater visibility, which is great, I think, uh, a term. And then I am going to do a plug. Uh, so my wife and I have actually written a book that's coming out in February. For, we think it's the first general interest publication on, on the world of groundwater. We had three, two goals, three goals, actually. One, not to make it a book about crisis, but to include examples of where some people are actually doing things. Two, this is my wife is a non-scientist, to make it look like, to read like a novel and not a USGS circular. <laughs> that took a while. Um, it's a lot harder, actually. And, and three, to cover the world, because groundwater is a world uh, resource, and actually the High Plains Act, the one we're talking about here today, is, of course, on the world stage, a very important aquifer. So with that, I think I'm done.